Imagine if you will. It's the mid-1990s and a 14-year-old Japanese boy is dealing with serious psychological issues. He feels perpetually isolated. No surprise, his mother died early, his father is always off working and emotionally distant, and he has no close friends. It's bad. He is eventually admitted to a psychiatric hospital where he goes through a series of treatments. And as is often the case with therapy, things initially feel even worse. One night, after a particularly exhausting day of therapy, the boy falls asleep and he begins to dream. He dreams of an empty city, perhaps a symbol for the emptiness he feels inside. He sees himself at a payphone, perhaps a symbol for his need for help, when suddenly a monster appears from over a hill and a scene like the Godzilla movies he watched as a small child unfolds before him. That is the opening sequence of Neon Genesis Evangelion. Now, Eva is a famously psychological series, with later episodes taking place largely inside the heads of characters as they debate with themselves. This has also frustrated fans as the big apocalyptic action ending was replaced with an ending more appropriate for a high art stage play. But allow me to suggest an alternate interpretation of the events of Neon Genesis Evangelion. They're all happening entirely inside Shinji's mind. Imagine Shinji is a troubled teenage boy who's sorting through all sorts of psychological issues through a long, complex dream. Gendo is not exactly his father. It's an amplified version of the serious Japanese salaryman who just doesn't know how to relate to his shy son. Misato is perhaps a version of Shinji's therapist, always willing to listen and always offering advice. Ritsuko is perhaps one of Shinji's teachers, a remote authority figure to be obeyed and a symbol of the working woman in Japan. Indeed, from a Freudian perspective, instinctual Asuka and hyperrational Rei map nicely onto the instinctual id and the hyperrational superego, with Shinji as pilot acting as the mediating ego. Ironically, I don't think the angels are directly representative of anything specific in Shinji's life. They're the Godzilla pattern that the dream is following. Japan comes under attack by giant monsters, so Shinji's subconscious provides monsters. Though instead of rubber-suited kaiju, his monsters are, to quote Forbidden Planet, monsters from the id. They are the amorphous fears, desires, and strange new information that can upset a sensitive teenager. Now, unfortunately, dreams rarely give us a satisfying ending. They're not meant to. They take our experiences and arrange parts of them symbolically, and in doing so, they help us sort through our thoughts. This explains the ending. If Shinji defeated the bad guys in the end in a big action sequence, that would be a false ending. We will never live completely free of fear and desire. The dream doesn't allow for such, such, a, for such a hollow conclusion. Instead, Shinji actually looks at his problems directly in the eye, symbolically of course, but still more directly than he has before. And then he finally sorts through the problems he's been having, finally aligns the past several weeks of real-world psychoanalysis with his own inner thoughts and feelings, and finally experiences a breakthrough. Thus the round of applause at the end. Shinji has resolved his inner problems and found a path forward. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that this is the only possible interpretation of Evangelion. I'm not even suggesting that this is the right interpretation, though I have heard that Anno himself has said he made the series so it could be interpreted this way. I am saying that this is an interesting interpretation that fits the show quite neatly. Or maybe it's just all in my mind.